I'm going to have three very experienced people join me up on stage. And they'll bring in three very interesting views, I think. Uh, first up, um, with 14 years' experience in the VC sector, uh, welcome to stage, Matthias. Thanks for Hi. coming. Hi. So you have 14 years of experience, and then you actually founded a company called Wert 8, yes. which translates into value 8. Yes. And uh, you're uh, helping family offices who want to invest in startups to find the right strategy for that. Is that right? That's right. That's uh, one part of our business. Um, we're, we're helping um, family office or uh, financial investors going to the market, finding the right uh, targets for them. Um, checking out what is their um, mindset, why do they want to invest in, in companies, in early stage companies, and uh, to find the right way for them. Yeah, okay, so someone who wants to invest in startups and doesn't quite know how to approach it yes. can come to you. Let's just switch sides. Okay. I'm gonna go over here, and I'm gonna welcome on stage from a startup that actually just raised a big round in January and did some seed investments before, uh, from G Predictive, Bjorn. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So as co-founder and CEO, of course, you're here to represent the startup side. And uh, I just mentioned you did three small seed, uh, or you see three seed investments, and then a, a round A, right? How much was the, the Series A? Two and a half million euros. Two and a half million euros. So this, uh, this man knows how to negotiate for money, I think. So we're very glad to have you here. And. Um, the third person who is going to complete our, our round is someone who has a lot of um, experience in the VC, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the merge and acquisitions area, right? So he's actually talking with both sides, the investors and the startups, trying to find a strategy, especially for a later stage. So a startup that might already have a first investment, how do they continue raising the next investment or maybe going for an exit? which very often, as we'll hear, is the motivation of uh, a venture capitalist that the startup would exit at some point. So welcome on stage, Jay from Cartagena Capital. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for coming. And um, we're going to make this uh, an, open, an open round. So if anyone here would want to have a question for these guys, of course, you can go to them afterwards. But also, feel free to give me a show of hands, and I'll make sure that we get a microphone for you. Now, if I'm an entrepreneur, Bjorn, and I need money, mm -hmm. we always need money as entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> really, how do yeah. I go about it? Like, How do I determine, A, how much money I need, and B, where to find it? That's a good question, yeah. Um, and it's two questions, actually. Um, the first question, how much money? Um, well, de definitely depends on the round you're in. Uh, I think that's ex at least my experience. So um, maybe in seed rounds, um, you don't plan for two years or even more. Uh, there, the, the cycle might be a bit smaller, uh, maybe 12 months. Because from my experience, it's quite an easy stage to raise money in because there are so many seed investors out there, many public ones as well. Um, and I think the process of uh, raising money in a seed round is a lot faster as well than in a Series A or even later. So um, do you just think up some number and you're like, yeah, that's roughly not right? Or do you make a huge Excel calculation, you know, forecasting revenues, costs? Like, what is the, of course, as founders, you want to spend your time probably on acquiring customers, doing right. customer service. You don't want right. to sit in, in the office every day crunching numbers, but you can't quite go into a negotiation with nothing to show, or can you? Actually, I mean, there, if, if you're, uh, as we did, uh, if you're contacting uh, public seed investors, they say, oh, I can give you this and this much. And then that's the number on the table. So you let them call the number, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can, you yeah. can read it in their leaflets. Uh. Uh, is that something that, that you guys have experience with? Uh, I think what's really useful is to think about the milestones of progress that a company <coughs> makes, uh, whether it's you know, product development, proof of concept, you know, market 
um, proof that the market exists, that the first customer can place the order, that your revenues can reach a certain point, that you can get a factory run and up, up and running. So whatever the key milestones are, because when you achieve something concrete, you increase the value of the company. So you should have a clear idea of how much money do you need to achieve the next or certain number of key steps. So you can go to the investors and say, put in this much, and here's what you will get. Here's where I will reach. Right. So to summarize that to some way, you know where you want to get in the next years, and then you break it down to the milestones. And then Bjorn would say, once you figured out how much you need for the next milestone, find the investor that has that number mentioned. Or maybe you could also look at a, a website like Crunchbase and see who has invested similar amounts, right? That's yeah, a do that. public website with uh, investments. Angelist as well, yeah. Angelist, yeah. So there is a lot of sources nowadays. And uh, yeah, of course, Matthias, you're... Perhaps you should, you should tell the, the, the founders out there that they should grab as much as they can. But yeah. in the point you really need the money, nobody will give it to you. So uh, be prepared to take the money when it's on the table yep. and uh, take it and try to work as hard as you can to, to, to come to the point where you can get the next bunch of money. Um, you told an, an founder should not sit in front of Excel and doing all these numbers, but he has to, to do other stuff. Um, my experience is that there are, there are a lot of funders, uh, founders uh, who really enjoy to do the Excel and not to talk to the customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the clear advice is go out there talk to people who want to buy your products and not sit in front of Excel. But of course, you have to know how many money you need in your, in your business model. Yeah. Right. And um, so you mentioned the point that I shouldn't, as a founder, go out trying to raise money in the moment when I need it, because that's probably too late. Yes. I've heard from different founders that it could take between a few days, in some cases, which are very happy cases, up to many months to actually close a deal, right? To negotiate um, the, all the different aspects of it, make sure that, that uh, both parties are aligned. So if you want to get those early contacts, so in that situation where we actually need the money, you're ready for the deal. How can you approach someone? So you, you don't think that you need money right now as an entrepreneur, but you should already make the, the contact. Um, how can you go about that? Where do you find those people with money? In the best case, they found you. That's what, what happened to you, that yep, uh, sure. the, the investor calls you and says, hi, so uh, code I'm, interested, is, I'm yeah. interested in your business and not uh, to call the, the investor and say them, hi, yeah. I'm interested in your money. Um, of course, you have to be visible. You have to be on, on um, stages like here. You, you have to show your face. You have to show your business ideas. and. Um, try to get in, in contact with the multipliers and with investors as early as you can. Yeah, so code and end is, your, a, is a very good ideas. way to, yes. to find investors and maybe similar uh, events as well. Yes, and and I think yeah. good investors are usually in touch with strategic parties or in partnerships and alliances who might be interested as investors. They also have good visibility in the marketplace, so the VCs become aware of them. So they already have the contacts sometimes in place, but uh, obviously it helps, and I, maybe I come from a biased perspective, but to bring a corporate finance advisor in to the process at the time when you want to run the process, because we can build on the contacts you have, uh, but also bring in a lot more related parties who might also be interested and do it on a timeline where they all come in at a similar time so you get a choice. And uh, Jay, I understand that you've also seen some deals already that were follow-up rounds, Series B or some, some later investments. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, does it become very easy to raise the money or do I still need to put in as much effort as I did in the first round to make sure even though I already know some of the investors yeah. that I get a good deal? What is your experience? Yeah, I mean, it, it does take a long time to raise money, and it takes a lot of effort from the management team and focus. Um, and so they should be aware of that. And, and I think we as an advisor can take a lot of that load away. Um, uh, it's, uh, how easy it is depends on how your, your revenue growth uh, has been and how attractive your future market potential is. Right. Yeah. Jorn, maybe in your case, uh, you mentioned those three small investments that you had in the beginning. Did any of those investors continue in the bigger round? No, they had to small for that. Um, they didn't take part anymore in the Series A. Um, so you had to start all over again, or uh... Uh, we had, uh, we had to start over again. Yeah, uh, raising actually, yeah. Um, and I think there's 
There's one thing you should really be aware of. Raising the Series A is completely different to raising seed money. Uh, seed money, as far as we experience it, uh, it, it was quite easy. Usually you have to have something like a business plan, uh, which is a lot of funny paper and nothing else, really. And, um, and in the end, they, they say, you need a business plan. But um, then they are honest and say, OK, I like you and your idea. And, that, and don't care much about the paper, really, the paperwork. Um, but raising a series A is, uh, is about KPIs for the first time. So you, you, have, to, you have to be able to, um, to produce figures from your, from, <laughs> from your sales processes. You have to be able to have a good estimate on how much it costs you to, get to, to acquire a new customer. All these figures are quite important in, that ra in, in raising Series A already. And, and that's an awful lot of work if you haven't done that before. So the process takes quite some time to, I mean, because usually when you start raising money, you, there is so much else to do because you want to have some traction and uh, acquire new customers and all this. And then there's always this work to be done. Did you use an advisor? Someone like Jay? No, we did not. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we should Next have. Time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the VC called him. That's a great position to be in. Sure. That's true, yes. And of course, there are different types of, of investment. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of VCs, business angels, crowdfunding. There is also the traditional line of credit that you might get from your bank. Um, maybe a question to all three of you. Um, Matthias, maybe if you want to start. Uh, what do you think, how can a founder quickly determine what is the, the, uh, the right type of investment? Well, that's de that depends on his business model. Um, uh, on the one hand, how much money does he need to succeed with his business? And on the other hand, what kind of risky is it for the investor to take part in the company? Um, for a bank who always wants to reduce the risk side, it might, they might be able to, to put 50,000 euro to an to a, um, Imbissbude, uh, rather than to invest in a tech startup with, with a high risk position, but on the other hand, um, a very big chance to, to become an international player. That's the, the first step to do is, what kind of business do I want to, to, to build? Um, and then w you have to look up what kind of uh, financing is the right choice for my, for my company. And these different ways of funding, they don't really compete with each other. They have very different characteristics. So um, uh, uh, crowdfunding is very public. Uh, it can generate a lot of buzz and interest amongst consumers. And people often use it to raise very small amounts. Um, and often they've already raised some of it, so they can easily show a success in, in the crowdfunding campaign. But what it does is sign up customers and general public to basically pre-order products. And you can often run this alongside a VC fundraising. So crowdfunding would be very good if you have a B2C product in, in, that, yeah. um, in that instance. Yeah. And then a line of credit if you have something where you, if you are already established enough to show <laughs> that there is low risk, probably that'll make yes. it easier with your bank. And in the other cases, I guess, depending on, on the amount, you start with the angels and the seed round, right? And then you can move on to, to venture capitalists, institutional investors later on. Um, so let's maybe try to look at it a bit from that investor side, right? So if someone is a, a VC or a business angel, what drives them you know, to, to go find companies that by all intents and purposes exist on paper and have some prototypes, but maybe no revenue or very little revenue, huge cost. And now these people say, awesome, let me put some money into that and see what happens, mm -hmm. right? What, what, uh, what triggers these people? Who would like to say something about that? <laughs> I mean, you are the guys. Uh, Nobody knows. Uh, 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 so investors I mean, are like are like women. You can't yeah. understand. That. Uh, business business angels are individuals, often very wealthy, and they love sponsoring entrepreneurs and ideas that they love. And it's often very personal. You meet you meet the person. They really like you and your idea, and they say, "Okay, I'm going to give you some money." And it's kind of a lifestyle choice for some people. Um, VCs much more difficult to get something that has uh, money for something that has no prototype. You know? Right. Yeah. So business but angels, of course, are, VCs, yeah. it's also a very personal decision if they want mm. to invest in a company or not, because it's always working with people. Mm. And so um, the, the people in the VC company has to work with the people in the funded company. Mm. And if the, they don't fit together, they won't invest. Mm. 
It's true. I've yeah. made exactly that experience because in the process of our raising uh, the Series A, um, the uh, the partner said to us very early in the process that at some point, quite early in the process as well, they will come and visit us in our office. And if they then want to go on, usually they will not kill the process anymore. And they have not started the formal due diligence uh, by no means then. So, um, I mean, all, well, you know, mm. having a look at the books and at the technical things, and uh, I think but they make their decision yeah. then. I think you, sh you, you have to show your vision, and they have to believe your vision and yes. share this dream of, of building something very big. And if, if the mindset is the same and the people can work yeah. together, then they are able to, to, to provide you the money <coughs> by convincing their investors that it's the right deal for them. Mm. So you could say in some ways it's, it's not so much about the negotiation that follows as long as during the due diligence nothing comes up that was unexpected, but it's much more about the people being aligned on, on the vision and on where is this company going, right? That could be... If you're talking to a VC, things. if yeah. you're trying to get money from a bank, it's something completely different. Then it's a different case, yeah. In the case of VCs or business angels, of course, one difference also might be that the business angels are very often investing their own money. With VCs, yes. it depends whether they're institutional, meaning they invest other people's money or their own. But in all cases, you would say it depends a lot on the relationship. There has got to be a fit. Yeah. So that's very interesting because one of the, um, the, the aspects that I, that I hear again and again is that valuation is really a very tricky point. But then in, in this approach, you could say the valuation is only fiddling with the numbers after you've already reached a basic agreement that you want to work together? Mm. Or is the valuation something that's much more fundamental? Mm -hmm. It's hard work. <laughs> in, in the end, um, doing the negotiations, and um, I know what, don't know what your experience is, but um, bringing um, the, 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 the treatment to an end and, and, and sign it and uh, have uh, <laughs> the, the valuation and the amount of money to invest in and all the, the, the details of, of uh, this um, well, the, the, even if we like each other, mm -hmm. it's uh, something uh, about money and, and, and we want to get money back as an investor. And so this is a, a strictly new game then. So it's not just everything is easy yeah. because we, we like each other. Mm -hmm. And the valuation, of course, that determines how many percent of a company you receive for a certain amount of money that you put in. And now, if you come from the, the corporate or financial world, um, and you have something like an internal rate of return, meaning I put a certain amount of money into this and then I can calculate how many percent I will receive each year. That's what you can do with projects um, in areas where you have a very, very good idea of how revenues are going to develop, which is probably not the case for at least 99% of startups, right? So, uh, Jay, what is, what is your experience in that field and can you maybe give uh, some suggestions to both startups and yeah. investors yeah. who are negotiating an evaluation. Is there some shortcut? Sure. Um, evaluation is not something that's a given. It's not inherent in the company. So you know, I, I don't think you should spend a lot of time with Excel models and then come up with a number and say, this is my valuation. Uh, I think you should have, you have some concrete milestones in the ground, so you know what was the previous round valuation, and you know that your investors expect it to have gone up, and you can put forward some milestones showing progress. So you can say, previously it was this much, and we've made progress. We expect it to be significantly higher. But you don't have to suggest a valuation and defend it. I think you have to go to the market and let the market speak. Um, and you know, sometimes people have to revise their expected valuation significantly downwards because there just isn't enough interest. And sometimes a, a number of strategics are saying, hey, we really want this. And then you can revise them upwards. So sometimes it helps not to state a valuation when you start. So then in the best case, you have at least two investors who are interested. And then you can uh, several. start negotiating or Absolutely. even more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you had, uh, Bjorn said he had like 40 uh, business cards <laughs> after yeah. Code N. Yes. But um, so, how do you go about uh, actually sorting out which which people you, were a genuinely good fit for your company, and uh, how many did you did you continue uh, talking to? Well, um, well, yes. Yeah, so we collected about 40 business cards, or even more, maybe uh, from VCs here last year uh, as a finalist. Um, but in the end, I think most of them 
uh, did not fit at all because I mean there's I don't know half of them that only for example invest in B2C businesses and then that's it and so in the in this process there's a lot of screening 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 to be done by them and by us and in the end we had three or four maybe that we really liked and I think there is there are three things that are really important about it first is that they have the money and I mean VCs always have it um, then there is they need to be trustworthy and you have to you have to talk a lot to them to be sure that this is the case and um, and for us the third thing that was really of importance was that they really knew what we were doing and they understood it and that they that we were sure that they could help us on the way because because we had the impression that they knew more about us than us them, uh, ourselves um, at least in some respects and um, and only very few fit these yeah. uh, prerequisites really in the best case then you want someone who has the money but also brings in the expertise industry exactly. expertise exactly or maybe an expertise in a, in a certain area that the founding team knows that they don't cover fully or maybe it's pointed out to them that they yeah are not as good as they think in a certain area like sales or yeah. maybe yeah. operations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. often, a, str sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, often a strategic can pay a, a much higher price <coughs> than you expect because they have a big existing business and they say, okay, if I get this technology, I can add this much to my existing business. And suddenly for them, it's worth much more than it is to a VC. So is that something that you also try doing a lot, finding those synergies where it's not just about the money, but it really comes down to some strategic fit where you say these two companies together create a value that none of them would have yeah, created yeah. if they continued uh, alone. Absolutely, and I think we did something similar with a company called Tardo, which is here. Um, last year, we completed a strategic investor round. That strategic investor saw the value they could create by bringing, you know, working with this technology internally. Um, and, and so you know, we work a lot in terms of finding companies that have a strategic fit. Mm. Are there any questions from the audience? Not so far. Everything has been answered. Uh, I still have. You've have talked about negotiations um, yeah. between the investor and, and the company. I think in the end, both sides should be uh, disappointed as much as they can. So it was a hard fight. Um, of course, they have different point of views to the, to the topic that's on the table. So there must be uh, the disappointment on both sides to be to be happy and uh, to find a way to spend the future together. Mm. And if you, if you look at the way the negotiations go, and of course there is, as I said in the beginning, a lot of details uh, when, you, when it comes to term sheets that you can talk about. And maybe one of the most interesting things, both for investors and startups, can be in the beginning of this phase where they work out the, the technical side of the deal, to get everything out of the way that doesn't really matter. So from your experience, is there some things that you say, this is what you should really focus on, this is where you have to negotiate hard, be ballsy, and then there is some other things, you know, that usually don't matter, are overrated, and uh, you, can, you can easily leave those aside, or is there any other way how you would approach a negotiation with your experience where you say, wow, if I had known this the first time I negotiated, I would have saved half of my time and probably half of sleepless nights as well. Um, I guess one example is liquidation preferences is sometimes more important than valuation. So for a VC who's putting money in, they say, okay, we could accept a higher valuation than we want, providing that in the event of an exit, we get the money first, if they have the liquidation preference. Right. So. <laughs> there is actually going to be a question. We're just getting the microphone. Yeah, over there. The gentleman on the left. So let's speak about money. Uh, what part of the cake you give to the guy who is financing you in general, just to have a rough idea? Because that is the main point. I mean, I make money, and what I have to leave to the guy who is mm. helping me? Or maybe it's a little bit confidential. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, it? it? I mean, it varies hugely from round to round, depending on... But how greedy these people are in general. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you take a, a VC firm, 
uh, often they'll want you know 25 to 30 percent of the company at okay. least if you're giving them five percent it's not worth their time and effort you know? so, uh, and you don't want to give them something close to a majority normally okay mm. right and from our experience um you know, when you're talking to vcs um they all tell you the same figures and fits perfectly well uh, for the Series A. Mm. Could be a bit less than 25, won't be 30, something between that. Mm. Um, and uh, so, that's, so that's one of the figures you have to know if you, want to if you want the valuation, to know the valuation of the company. And then there's the other thing, how much money are you going to get? And from our experience, um, this is not, you know, it, it, and <laughs> this is not uh, down, uh, to, down to discounted cash flows. Uh, what we did, and what our VCs did as well, was have a look of how much money we would need to cover the next two years and have some good traction after that. And, um, and then we put some more money on it, and even more money, until we finally arrived at the amount that we agreed upon, and uh, the amount, you know, and the shares that we had to give away, that didn't change. So I think there's no, oh, it's the company's worth five million or ten million or two or whatever. So it's a Series A. So you're spend, so you're giving away something between twenty and thirty percent of the company, mm. and you get as much money as you need. In, you know, in a certain bandwidth, of course. But in the end, it's a question of how strong is your position in the negotiations. If there is only one investor interested in your company bringing money <coughs> in, so you're in a very bad position. But if there are two or three investors battling about uh, who's the one who's let in, so it's better and, and the share you have to give is smaller. But um, in the end, it's very often that, is there, that there is only one investor. And um, so in the end, you have to look in, into his eyes, and he has to look in your eyes mm -hmm. if you find a way th that is fair enough for both positions. And you talked about being ballsy. So if you have just one investor, then you don't have that competitive situation. But if you can instinctively sense that that investor really wants to invest in you for strategic reasons or for whatever, maybe you can still say, well, it's this much, or I walk away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be probably the high risk version, but maybe better than taking a deal that you're not really happy with, right? Yeah, yes. and well, you need to have a backup plan if he says no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, and, which, and you have options. You can get more money from your existing investors. You can reduce your costs and continue <laughs> a process and yeah. so on. So, so um, maybe as a, as a closing question, Bjorn, when you received the investment, did that really allow you to step things up? Are you now hiring wildly? or scaling somewhere else? Are you really able to transform the money into business value? Well, I, I can answer that later, maybe. But we, we can, but yeah, we can really change what we're doing now. Um, we received the money in January and um, doubled the number of employees since then. And I think we'll put another six, seven people on the, on the roster uh, by the end of the year. And um, you can so really see some differences now, some very positive changes in, you know, in very early stage KPIs, really. So, sure. yeah. So money is good if you get it on good terms, right? I That's what, I, so, what yes. I hear you saying. Yes. Yeah. Well, OK, is there any other question from the audience? You can still reach out to these guys. I think they're going to be around for a few more minutes. And uh, thank you so much for joining me on stage. That was very insightful for me. I hope also for you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.